Now, before we get into it, I want to drop this nugget. I am so excited about today's episode because it kicks off a bit of a rewind of one of the series that I know will be a positive influence on you. You see, twice a year, I get the opportunity to host and sponsor Couples Love Week. It's a signature Denise Taylor Live event where I bring five couples to the virtual stage and we talk about relationship and we talk about love. You know, one of the things that I believe we can do is we can thrive as his wife. So much so that I created a community called the First Wives Club. And the First Wives Club has been around since November of 2019. This community has organically grown to over 1,300 women worldwide. That continues to blow my mind. The thing that we have in common is we want to win at this love game. Now, another thing that you may not know is that in addition to the success superpowers, I also have what I call the relationship superpowers. And there's five of them as well. And before we get into today's episode with the incredible couple who is going to come and share from their heart, I want to share a little bit about relationship superpower number one. Listen twice as much. You see, communication is one of the things that will help any relationship. If we show up authentically in our communication, we can reap the benefits that sits on the other side from being present, available, and authentic in our communication. But what I find is oftentimes we are good speakers in communication, but we are not good listeners. And what makes intimacy happen in a relationship that creates a bond of unity is when you listen twice as much. You listen for all the cues that are at play, the tone, the expression, more than the words. I believe our willingness to openly share with one another, and even more than just sharing, but to express and receive the words and tones and expression will help to stimulate intimacy and draw you together. Now, I want you to listen for the example of listen twice as much when we get into the conversation with the Burns. Now, let's get into it. Well, hey now, it's Denise, and I have something special just for you. We recently celebrated Ride or Die season as a part of my signature Denise Taylor Live event, Couples Love Week. Twice a year, we go deep on love, relationship, and winning together with five featured couples. And recently, we talked with those Ride or Die couples anchoring in on faith, love, family, commitment, and trust. Today's Rewind episode features night one of that live event. You can't be a ride or die unless you have faith. Complete trust and confidence in God and one another. Faith is not a contract, it's a surrender. And after 30 plus years of marriage, Anthony and Robin Burns have faithfully surrendered to one another and to the call on their lives. As pastors, they serve and build together. We'll discover more about the power of faith in their relationship success and its longevity. We'll also tap into their journey of growing together in love. I am going to invite this wonderful couple, Dr. Burns and Lady Burns, to the virtual stage with me. They have agreed to come and be a part of Couples Love Week, and I am so excited to have them. Now, what some of you don't know is they have been pretty instrumental in my faith walk and my faith journey. And so, you know, I was sitting here and my heart was pounding a little fast, and I was like, well, what's going on? You know, like, why am I nervous? I've done 
this so many times, but it's almost like inviting your mom and dad over and you're cooking for the first time. This is the first time that Lady B was on my other show, but this is the first time that I have had a chance to have Dr. Burns on the show. And so I am so thoroughly excited to have him and Lady Burns come in to share with us about faith. When I thought about this being an aspect of relationship, I knew exactly who I wanted to bring to the table because they have such an incredible story. So welcome to you both. I know you got to turn your uh, mic on. There you go. Welcome to you both. I'll let you greet everyone. Um, welcome, Dr. Burns. Welcome, welcome, Lady Burns. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Sister Denise. Good evening, everyone on social media. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sister Denise, for having us on. Absolutely. We're excited to be on, always excited when it comes to couples and, you know, building relationships. And so thank you for having us on. And I, I know you're going to be blessed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as a definition for faith, this is what I had tagged for your day, that faith was complete trust and confidence in God and one another. And so when I thought of that whole theme of ride or die, you know, that's a colloquialism that you hear all the time about that person who is down, right, to go through with you. I knew that one aspect of that was faith. Like when you think about relationships without faith, you kind of shake your head and wonder how they're doing it, right? Because faith is such a huge factor when it comes to longevity in relationships. So we'll unpack that more. But it is a tradition of Couples Love Week, Dr. Burns, for you to introduce your beautiful wife. So I am going to pass the mic to you. And this is your suave moment to say all those <laughs> lovely things. You, you see, you so see how well, my, 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 my brim. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I see you pulled out your brim. So go ahead and do us the honor of learning more about the lady you love. Well, this is my one and only. I've been married 31 years um, to this lovely lady. Lady, we have two children, and don't ask me how old they are. Uh, I got that part. <laughs> she says she got that part, <laughs> but uh, we've been married uh, 31 years. It's going to be 32 this year, and I think I got that right. You got that. Okay, I already looked over there. I don't know if I had. You know, the brothers always trip up on that one. You know. But um, she's definitely um, the rib, as the Bible said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I understand why when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man, you know, and so, yeah, this is my baby right here. Yeah, she caught your eye like that. I know the story. You was kind of checking her out on the J-O-B. She caught your eye and you was yelling, whoa, man, down the hall. <laughs> and, okay, I ain't going to get ahead of myself. I said, and she made me chase her. <laughs> like she should. Oh, All right, <laughs> Lady B, do us the honor and introduce your handsome husband. Yes, this is my handsome, fine husband, Anthony D, or let's say, I'll say Anthony DeVere, but we say Anthony D. Burns. To me, he's Tony, but affectionately, he is honey love, sweetie, bae, tone, and None of y'all business. None of y'all. I, I can't tell you the other part. But this is this is my husband who loves me dearly, who has been my by my side from day one, who continues to be by my side, who loves me unconditionally. I'll say through the ups, the downs, the ins, the outs. I mean, he is my hugest support. And um, we, we just, we making this thing work by the grace of God, by the help of God, with the help of God. And yeah, I would have, I, I couldn't even imagine no other way than right. to be with Tony B. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. So, so Dr. Burns, I believe that there's a moment in every love story when you know that that person is the one. Now you told us you were chasing her, but soon after the chase, I'm sure there was a moment where you knew you wanted to spend your life with Lady Burns. Tell us about that. Well, I, I did everything that I was big and bad enough to do. And, you know, when I got to the place where I felt it was time for me to really get, take life a little more serious, serious, I, um, came into contact with, with Christ and 
got my life to, on the right track. And I had a, a list of non-negotiables, you know, and there were some things I can negotiate, but there were some things I couldn't um, negotiate with. And my top three on my, on my list, after I met her and got to talk with her, she met those criterias. And so I knew then that I was going to spend the rest of my life with her. Well, you know, I'm nosy enough to ask, what were the top three? Um, and, and interestingly enough, one of my top three sometimes irks me now. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's talk about so, it. So my top three, um, one was because I was became a Christian and I knew that, you know, I tried a lot of different things and I knew that was it for me. I knew it was real for me. Um, whoever I connect with, they had to be as serious about it as I was. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing was uh, they had to be independent because I was, at that time I had I was some real estate property and I had a couple of businesses. And so I was always moving around and I just, I just couldn't have nobody that, you know, demanded, you know, a lot of whatever. <laughs> and, 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 um, she would jump in the car and go to Indiana to see her mama or her sisters like it was down the street. And, and so every time I would call her, she would be on the highway or she would be somewhere. And I was like, okay, that's who I need right there. Somebody who, you know, they already got it going on they stuff. Mm -hmm. And and then the, the, the third thing was somebody who wanted to go to Africa. At that time, I, I really thought that God was calling me to be a full-time missionary in Africa. And so I went over for three months. I lived in the jungles of Africa and did missionary work. And when I came back, I knew that that's, that, that was my calling. So whoever I connected with, they had to be willing to serve God in Africa. And, and I met a, several people and they, were, they weren't trying to hear that. But when I met her, she was like, oh, yeah, I always wanted to go to Africa. And then the music started playing in the background, the heart started. I started floating and I was like, it was over there. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, I would imagine a lot of people probably can also ad identify with the, the strength and the overwhelm of the independent woman. Cause out of those three, that had to be the one you was talking about. That's right. <laughs> Hey, Lady B, um, what would you add to the love story? And then tell us a little bit about your family. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start off, but I'll first start with telling you a little bit about my family. Um, I really feel that I am truly blessed and favored of God. And I don't say that just as like a cliche or um, anything, but I, God knew what he was doing when he sent me, first of all, my husband, and then my, my two children, Leon, my oldest, and Lemar, uh, my, my youngest, and then my, my two granddaughters, uh, Gabriella and Alila. God, God just knew it was, if I could say a perfect match, um, God put us all together. And so um, I'm thankful for my sons. Leon is um, still, he, he's part of the Milwaukee Police Department and um, he's doing his thing there. Lemar, he is, uh, Lemar is newly engaged. I guess I don't put that out there. <laughs> Lemar, he, he's, he has a job too, but he's newly engaged. And that's, that's exciting. That's something different for us, of course. Um, and so that's, that's going to be exciting. But then our granddaughters, um, they are so precious to us. Uh, many of you know our story of how I wanted two girls when I was, um, um, when, when I was expecting. And I was believing at the very moment um, of delivery time that I was going to have two girls or, you know, but that didn't happen. God knew. God knew all of that. And so then God graced us with two granddaughters and they are our heart and joy and they keep us going. They keep us vibrant. They keep us lively. So, yeah, we're just I'm thankful for for my family and who um, who God has uh, graced us with. And then I guess to add to the, the love story, um, it was it was real interesting because I was at a place um, when, when we first met, I, I had just accepted Christ. I had just moved to Milwaukee from um, Gary. 
And um, I accepted Christ before I left uh, Gary. And so I was on, I was on a move and I was in love with Christ. I didn't want no man. I had already had all those relationships and da, 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 da. And so when I got here, my intent was to, to really just be like an evangelist and tell people about Christ. I, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want a relationship anymore. And yeah, lo and behold, you know, he came into my life. God knew and that independent spirit, um, <laughs> that independence that I had, um, it was it was somewhat of a um, hindrance because I was totally dependent. I was I was on the go, like he said. I would go to Indiana. I would do this, and it was like I don't need any help. And and he 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 said that he heard me tell one of my friends early on, and I, I guess like the first year of our relationship. Um, I mean, of our marriage that I didn't need no man. I don't remember saying that. She said that. I, I don't remember saying. And, and it wasn't. That she ain't tell a friend. She told me that. Oh, I told you that. When I was, oh. I, it was something. I don't know what we were trying to do, and she looked me straight in the eye and said, "I don't need no man." Uh, I was like, "What?" But she didn't um, want no Tony. You Michael proved Henry. all that wrong. You proved I all did. that wrong. She needs you. She loves you. Oh, she can't oh. live without you. You got it. You got it. Yes, and 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 that all flipped the script because I did, and I do need him. God has helped me to see that um, I need him in my life, and he completes me. I mean. Yeah, I, I I don't know what I would do without. Yeah. <laughs> I, love <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, it's it's incredible to think about being married 31 years. That's a really long time. Congratulations <laughs> to you guys. You guys are coming up on 32. But yeah. Lady B, if I could take you back, right, mm-hmm. to your wedding day, what did you treasure most on that day? Um, on that day, it was, it was, um, very, uh, what's the word? I, I didn't know it, it was, it all, it all happened so fast, first of all, because, um, mind you, we were only together for nine months before he proposed. I mean, no, eight months before he proposed. And then within a month or two months time, we got married. So in, within nine months, I met him, we dated we got married, da, 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 da. So I didn't know where this was going, um, but I trusted that God was getting ready to do something great in my life. And so um, if I could say something that I treasured was that I was on an adventure, didn't quite know what it was going to turn out to be like, but I was thankful that, that God was in the midst um, and that I was going, I was going on for the ride. And so I was just, I was excited to be married. So just thinking about the fact that I'm getting ready to change from singlehood to, to married life. And I got someone because though during those months of dating, he, he proved himself real well, even though I was still trying to play kind of hard to get, but um, he proved to me that he loved me. He wanted me and he wanted to spend the rest of my rest of his life with me. And so Um, I was thankful and I treasured the fact that I'm getting ready to be in a relationship that is going to be um, a wowing one, if I can say. Wow. You know, I didn't even know that story. But when I think about the sovereignty of the topic being faith, what you really kind of walked in in that moment wasn't necessarily a bunch of expectations, right? It was just a willingness to go forward together in what you felt like God had ordained for your life. And so starting at that pivotal place of faith and now being on this side of it, right, where you're Mm -hmm. 32 years in, um, something that started out far shorter than what some people would even say is the right way to do it. Right. You know, I'm sure your family was like, you doing what? You know, know, (laughs) they were giving you all those kind of looks, you know, when you think about faith playing a factor in the very beginning, what's kind of the highlight for you now? Right. Cause that that's huge. I didn't even realize that your story started off that way. But that's a real pivotal point for faith. So what would you say as you look back now? What would you say? Well, let let me say this. um, And and it just seems God God is just God is awesome, Denise. He is awesome in how he takes care of us. And he shows us along the way what we need to know and so forth. But at the beginning of our relationship, I mean, when we got married, um, he was 
he was preparing to be ordained as a minister. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, where is this going? Because <laughs> I didn't, you know, I, I definitely didn't um, expect that. Didn't know that he was going to be a minister. And then, what, three years later, um, he became a pastor. And I was like, okay, this is really um, taking an interesting turn because I know that I didn't even think about even want to be a, a pastor's wife. So it's like, okay. And then when we got into um, the teachings and learning about faith, I didn't know about faith. I, I didn't. I just knew that um, as a as a child and teenager and young adult, I went to church and I listened to the word. You know, I did what I did, um, but I wasn't really taught faith. And so it was early on in our relationship and in in um, the pastoring part that I learned about faith. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand it totally, but I I initially just really kind of. If I, if I can say this, I, I smooched off of his faith or I leached off of his faith because I didn't know it. I didn't understand it. And he was putting out some faith stuff, Denise. And I'm like, but how is that going to happen? How is that going to work? Because intellectually, I'm thinking one plus, like I, I thought about one time during the summertime as a teacher, you know, we didn't get paid. And so I knew what our funds were looking like. And he was saying we were going to do this, this and this. And I'm like, well, we don't have the finances to do that. How are we going to do that? And he's like, we just going to trust God and da-da-da. I'm like, just trust God. what? So, and it was not only that one, but it was several times that this kept coming up. And I'm like, what is this faith thing? And then it got to the place where I stopped desiring to, to kind of lean on his faith. And I told God, I said, God, I want that kind of faith. I want the faith where I can trust, lean and depend wholly on you. And, and see the results for myself and not just see the results because of what he's been um, expecting or believing God for. So um, the, the faith piece was, was quite interesting, um, but it's, it's been good. And so now, you know, I, I got my own faith, you know, <laughs> but at that time, I, I almost would say in that portion, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like we weren't unified because he had faith and I didn't have faith, but I was so I, it may, maybe I can say grace. God graced me. He gave me the grace and he gave me the mercy until I got my own. And then, I mean, now it's like, shoot, we can conquer the world. That's awesome. <laughs> so, That's yeah. awesome. You yeah. kind of mentioned this a little bit, you know, that when you started off in the relationship, you, you didn't have visibility of him being called to pastor. So Dr. Burns, tell me about that time where you're sharing this mandate on your life and it's time to serve as a pastor with Lady B. What was that whole experience? You coming home, you like, baby, I'm about to be a pastor. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was interesting because when I talk about my, you know, my top three non-negotiables, you know, part of that was I really needed to know that she was solid as a believer. And so, believe it or not, even though I knew I was getting ready to be ordained as a minister, when when when, she, when I was dating with her, she thought I was unsaved. And so she was always trying to get me saved. <laughs> <laughs> and so I I I would I didn't lie to her and say I wasn't saved, but I did give her that impression. And so she was always trying to lead me to Christ. And then uh, when I really, when she, when she found out, she really wasn't, she felt kind of deceived a little bit. So she, she had, she had a little issue with that, but I just needed to be sure, you know, that, that she knew, you know, what she, what she knew. And so when it, when we went to, to that point, I was at a traditional church and she was contemporary. So she didn't wear the big hats and the long dresses and things like that. And so she really wasn't welcome in my church. (laughs) You know, now I had my group in the church that, you know, loved Tony and whatever was connected to me was good. But some of, you know, you know, some of the saints wasn't quite there yet, you know. And so trying to help her to, to see how I was how I was growing and what what was going on there, it was it was kind of we. She was at one church, I was at another church, and so she she it didn't it didn't necessarily. I don't know if it caught her off guard or not, but you know she wasn't part of that journey, kind of. You know what I'm saying? As far as the Christian journey inside of there, now we would fellowship with each other churches uh, on different annual days or whatever, 
but because she wasn't in church in the church where I was, she didn't see how I was moving up spiritually in the in the church. And so then all of a sudden she knew, boom, now I'm getting ready to be a pastor. Mm-hmm. And her first thing was uh, she cried. I did. And she cried because she didn't want to be a pastor's wife <laughs> because she had that image of the, the big hats and the long dresses and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so that's what made it unique um, at Jericho because I made her a promise that she would be able to be herself. And then I took the hits for her not fitting into the, you know, the traditional pastor's role and pastor's, and wife. pastor's wife role mm-hmm. role and and that's kind of how Jericho kind of ended up being kind of how it's been you know contemporary you know down that middle of the road kind of thing not necessarily hooping it out but being a teacher and all of that mm-hmm. and so I don't know if that made sense now. that makes sense all right yeah that definitely made sense um and I love how you found a way to honor your call in your relationship, right? You didn't say, well, you just got to come along with the the plan or you just got to come along with the way things are. I love how you said in that, I'll take the hit and I'm going to work on changing the environment so that it fits both of us and fits the vision for where we want to go. And to me, that's the beautiful part of prioritizing one another I think I would have had that reaction too, you know, kind of (laughs) like, you know, um, I'm not sure I signed up for this. (laughs) I don't know what this is going to mean to our life, but I love that it went back to you having those non-negotiables because you knew that she loved God enough to be able to trust the journey and the process that she saw him in as the two of you kind of navigated together. So I love that. Um, When you think about your relationship and what transition, what was the impact on your relationship, if anything at all, when you were going through that transition and assuming the new titles and roles, did it bring you guys closer together? Did it force good conversations, understanding? What kind of things impacted in the relationship? Either of you can answer. Well, first of all, the, 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 the pastor role or the call of my life role, the Christian role, but then there was a married role too. So whether you're a pastor or you're not a pastor, when you get married, <laughs> there are some learning curves in marriage and it doesn't really have anything to do with how, mo- how well you love God, how much you know about the Bible, or how, how often you go to church, it becomes, you see inside of yourself, you know, for who you are, if you're a selfish person or a stubborn person or for whoever you are. And now making the marriage work is one thing. And the one thing I, I can say I appreciate about her now that I didn't appreciate that much then, even though I respected it, she wouldn't fake for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So if we went to church, if we if we was arguing at home, and we, we went to, well, if we wasn't getting if we wasn't on the same page at home. When we got to church, she wasn't gonna smile and wave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she wasn't gonna front for me. You know, to, to let's get through this service, and then we we pick it back up when we get home. And so that forced me to have to get you know to try to make things right before I got to the church. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to make it right. I had to. Well, I had to I had to figure out how to make that work before I got there because I know she wasn't gonna fake it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it was the married part. It was building a relationship on the marriage level, and that was really kind of outside. Who we were as Christians came into play as far as how much we were willing to die to ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, because once God showed me something about me. Now I had to make a decision. Well, I saw this growing up. You know, this is how them, all the birds men were. This is how you're supposed to be a man. But then seeing it in the Bible, I said, no, nah, that's that's not right. And then have to make that decision to die to myself for what I knew, the way that I knew, and adopt his way. You know, like he says in First Peter, he talks about it. If if um the well with our wives with knowledge, 
And if we don't, then he won't hear answer my prayer. Well, I thought that was unfair. You know, <laughs> like, why are you going to answer my prayer? Well, if she messed it up. But then I had to begin to learn that she was God's daughter. And then I thought about how can I approach God for anything mistreating his daughter? And how would he feel, you know, be mistreating his daughter? And so then whether we were getting along or not getting along or in agreement or not in agreement, I had to always respect the fact that she's God's daughter. And I definitely don't want to be messing around, messing up with God. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Did I answer that? I you know, so. I make my living by talking. So. <laughs> no, that, that was good. You know, as you were talking, it made me think about something that I say often, which is we have to be willing to grow personally in order to soar relationally. And yeah. what you walk through, you're like, yeah, I had this role, this role and that role, but this role required me to do some personal work. And it required me to be accountable, accountable personally to someone else other than myself, which meant I needed to check some of the things that I thought I thought were accurate or behaviors that I had. And that's often a hard journey for people to take, right? Because especially when they have been groomed and you got family history and this is how my cool uncle did it. Or this is how my, you know, <laughs> if you got family history where you're like, we're legends, we're legendary in this way, right. you know, and you're trying to come in and you're like, but that don't match, match up with what God is saying. And mm-hmm. me doing that is mistreating her. And so I love how you were um, transparent in that way. You know, one of the things that I really have grown to appreciate, and, and Lady Burns talked about this a little bit, is the lifestyle of faith that you guys have taken on, right? And how you've been able to grow in it. In fact, I learned a lot about faith as well when I was there with you guys. And so I got a chance to see that growth happened not only in yourselves, but in the congregation. And I got a chance to be a part of it. So when you think about that, when you think about the power of faith and how transformative it was for your life, when it comes to marriage and relationship with Lady B, how has that been so key in your journey, the faith aspect? Well, it it started out early because I did all my checks and balances, right? I got my non-negotiables. I, you know, played like I wasn't saved so I can really see how deep she was and, <laughs> and, you know, how strong she was in her faith. And I did all of those things. But then when things were not what I wanted them to be or with, when we weren't speaking, because that was times early on, early on, mm-hmm. year, as, as yeah. Bishop said, years ago, years ago, yeah. <laughs> when something would happen, we would we we'll be in the house like two ships passing in the night. We yep. a whole week would go by before we were speaking. Oftentimes it was because Sunday was coming up. I you know I had to get it right. You know what I mean? If, if Sunday wouldn't have came up, I don't know how long that that nonsense would have went on. You know what I mean? But then it's in those times that faith plays the a critical role because if if you're saying that in your non-negotiables. That, that, that God met your criteria and that you believe she is the one that God has assigned to you as your wife in those times when it don't make sense, those times when you can't see it, those times when you don't like what's going on, those times when you ain't feeling it, it's those times that really is when faith kicks in mm-hmm. because I got to believe that God knew what I needed and that even though I don't see why it's this way right now, uh, I have to believe um, by faith that 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 this is this is this is needed in my life. Mm-hmm. Let, let me say this in passing. So I worked as the engineer for the Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, I think eighteen years, something like that. And uh, that's like the head janitor kind of guy. And you know, I made a lot of money. Oftentimes, made more than the teachers made uh, with my salary, but but the teachers would treat me like dirt. <laughs> Not because, you know, I was well-groomed and, you know, I carried myself, you know, I was a big boy, big man on the campus, but they just thought they were better than me, you know, and they would look, you know, condescending and stuff. And I said to myself, whenever I got married, I would never, never marry a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that 
And then, you know, I married a teacher. But watch this now. When I thought about how jacked up my English was, <laughs> you know, uh, God knew that I needed a teacher <laughs> in my life. But having faith to believe in those times that she still is the one. She still is the um, God didn't make a mistake, you know. And so what is that I need to learn? How do I need to adjust my life? Where do I need to grow? What do I need to do in those moments? It forced me to, to grow because I had to trust God when it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, early on, if, if um, some money got misused or something, then now you got an attitude about it. Where now, if something happened, it ain't no big deal. Well, it happened, you know, we do better on the next one. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's like Abraham with his, killing his son, you know. Abraham was willing to kill his son. Labor, look at me like I preach it out. Yes, you uh, are. He was no. willing to kill his son. Wait, wait, let, wait, let me say this to wait. him. He was willing to kill his son wait. because wait. he knew wait. that God could raise him back up again. And I'm saying that now, in whatever we go through, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, because you got faith that God, God's going to make it right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it does, your faith plays a, a major part mm -hmm. in being able to grow together and trust each other and all that. Nah, what I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, of you yeah, who yeah, are yeah, tuned yeah. in, you just got a little <laughs> mini sermon from Dr. A.D. Burr. Uh, look, at, look at the chat say, preach, pastor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that is one of the dangers of bringing a pastor on to the set. They might Whoa. slide right on into a healthy sermon, but we, we definitely appreciate the Abraham and knife scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I had a front row seat at is you releasing your faith for some big things, right? As a part of this lifestyle of faith and you look at resources and you're like, they're not there, but my vision and my God inspired call says that I need to pursue that. And sometimes people find struggle with that, right, of releasing the faith for the big things, kind of like Lady B said early on, where she's like, okay, I'm looking at the numbers and they're not necessarily adding up to being able to be feasible for that. So Lady B, as you consider the journey and overcoming that challenge, right, that challenge of reality versus faith, Help us understand how we can navigate that a little bit better because you've been able to go on that journey and now you got your own faith. <laughs> right, right. I think the navigation comes when you have that sincere relationship with God, not just saying, oh, I know God or, you know, I know about God or I read his word, but really, really knowing that you know God and you have a relationship with him because um, in that relationship, He's going to show you some things. He's going to allow you to be um, tested, tempted, whatever. Um, but you got to know that he's got your back. And, and I think about um, how even during our, our time of, of um, what I'll say, lack, there, there's been times where we've had lack, um, especially in our finances. But uh, God has proved himself time after time after time. And so it's like, okay, God, you've proven yourself over and over. So I have no other choice but to trust you. Even though it was looking dim and, and, and things weren't looking, you know, like what I thought they would look like or be the way that I thought they would be, I knew that I had to trust God because he came through. And so we coined the, the um, term, we coined the phrase, God always comes through. It's just a matter of time. And so um, that, I, I would say that's, that's it for me, just knowing to uh, trust God, trust him in the process, trust the process, trust him knowing that he's going to, he's going to come through and he's going to make it work for your, for your good. And so that's, that's pretty much yeah, it. Yeah, that, that's huge too, because early on, you know, with some of the challenges that we had, you know, um, our son cut his finger off and they said it wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be able to use it no more. And he's playing drums and you can't even look at his fingers to tell which one. It was in in that moment though, uh, when my other son broke several bones in his arm when he was in Indiana and they put a cast on it and sent him home because they said it was nothing that he could do. But in the emergency room that night, it was the best hand surgery for the finger. In the emergency room that other night, it was the, the best bone doctor for, for the other son. 
And it was, like she said, time and time again, and we, it was having the right heart attitude, mm -hmm. you know, that choosing that we, we wasn't going to, we wasn't going to worry about stuff, you know? And so when stuff, the crazy things would happen, we were looking at each other and saying, let's see how God can work this one out. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, boom, yeah. you know? And so, so it's that heart attitude, it's, you know, going back to that faith and trusting God, he put you together. He allowed you to get together. He's with you no matter what it looks like, what you're going through, being able to have the right attitude, a spirit of expectation that God's going to come through with this thing. He going he I don't know how he going to fix it, but he going to come through in this thing. Sermon number 2. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. All right. So, from the outside looking in, there are a lot of people especially that may be kind of you know, I wouldn't say shocked because we all have our stories and testimonies from a relationship standpoint. But from the outside looking in, you all look like y'all got it going on, right? You know, um, you've been married for 32 years. That's just not heard of much anymore, right? You know, posting numbers up like that. But as you reflect on your love journey, Lady B, what mm -hmm. advice would you give to wives who are struggling in their marriage? What would you say to them? I would say, um, thinking back to, for me, when, when it all began, when we were having challenges, even early on, um, that's how my prayer life began, um, is to pray, first of all, to pray um, and, and, and really seek God. And, and also to not be ashamed or afraid to, to get help to get counseling. Um, that was something else that we did because we were at a place where we weren't quite um, meshing or, or we weren't at that place where we were on totally on one accord. And we, we realized that we needed some help. And that's how we began our journey of um, going to uh, uh, couples, couples uh, events or couples conferences um, because we knew that we needed some, some help, some advice. And so we, we did that. So the prayer, um, the, the, the couples conferences and, and just being able to communicate. We, we learned early on also that um, two of the top reasons that people divorce were uh, communication and finances. And, you know, those were areas that, that we too had to deal with. And so being able to communicate and, and talk about what's going on, because I, and like he said, we would go on for a week or so or several days and not say anything. And he would ask me what's wrong. And I would say nothing. <laughs> and that would be it. And don't talk to me. Don't ask. Because I felt like if I told him he wasn't going to receive it. And then he, and you know, when, when we got into our, our conversations and we got to talking, you know, he had this look. And so it was kind of intimidating. So I didn't want to talk to him because I knew I was going to start crying. So I, I got to the place where Lord, I need, we, we need some help. So, um, that's that's how that part came about because I got tired of saying nothing's wrong and and walking around the house not speaking to each other so we had to learn how to communicate so I would say prayer um, uh, getting help conferences uh, even if you have to go to a counselor of some sort do it do it because we vowed till death do us part and we decided also early on we were going to turn off the exit lights we weren't leaving we weren't leaving and so um, we had to work it out. And so that's it. Prayer, uh, conferences, communication. Okay, that's good. And Dr. Burns, what advice would you give to husbands that may be struggling in their marriage? I would say on the same on the same line. I would say it like this: uh, you have to. We have to invest in our marriage. We invest in vacations. We invest in clothes. We invest in cars. We invest in just about everything else. But when it comes to marriage, when you ask the average person how much they actually invested in their marriage, it's little to nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, and, and I was the drawback when, it, when we went started going to the marriage conferences. And we've been doing that now for probably 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes twice a year, different ones. But in the initially, I didn't want to go. I was a Bible school uh, graduate. I, you know. I was a preacher, you know, and, you know, soon to be a pastor. And I didn't, they can't, what they gonna tell me, you know? That was the problem. You know, 
Nobody, <laughs> nobody could tell him anything. And he thought he knew everything. And he was never wrong. And it's, I was it's, crying it's to turn. God. God, turn. he always makes it seem like he's right. And I'm always wrong. God, do something to him. So, so uh, we went to this marriage conference. And I'm sitting in this marriage conference, not wanting to be there. But I'm there because she, she gave me this kind of, she won't say it, but it was the ultimatum. It was just one spelled out. But as a husband, I knew, you know. And so I went and I was sitting there with that attitude that nobody can't tell me nothing. And this guy began to walk through scriptures that I thought that I knew. And they began to speak volumes to me because I know that wasn't the way I was. And so I'm saying to the husband, you know, I'm like Paul, Paul said he was the chief sinner, you know, well, I don't know if there was many husbands that was more stubborn than I was. And I still got my moments, you know, but it's a man thing. We don't, we don't feel like we need help. We don't feel like we want to go get no help, but listen, that was the best thing that I could have done. You know, I don't know who want to catch hell every time they go home or who want to live can I say that on here? Uh, or, <laughs> or, or who who want to be in misery every time you got you got to go home? You stand out in the street so you don't you won't go home. Listen, they say the grass greener on the other side, but when you get over there, it's dyed. It ain't even real grass. But if you put some fertilizer on your own grass, mm -hmm. yeah, and put a little water on that bad boy. Mm -hmm. So I would say to the husbands, invest in your marriage. You know, marriage conference or counseling, therapy. I mean, those people, they studied, you know, relationships and things of that sort, you know? And it's okay to be wrong. And you know- Hello. You know, I mean, it ain't- He said, you heard it first here. <laughs> it's okay to be wrong. Did y'all hear that? Type that in the chat. It's okay. He said, you know, pastor said, it's okay to be wrong. I mean, Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, you know? It is Lord. what it is. She, listen, she, she said, um, she said, I think I, she said that I thought I thought that I that I thought I knew everything. And, and I said to her, well, I, I would be dumb to, to to think that I don't know and be trying to do something. I'm doing it because I think I, I think I do know what I'm doing. And so, you know, um, in doing it, we find out that maybe that's not the right way or maybe that's not it. But as a man, you know, being willing to make that investment, let somebody help you. If, if something wrong with your car, you take it to get, have somebody check it out. If, if something wrong with your plumbing, you call a plumber, you know. And so you, you invest, you, if something wrong with your shoe, well, you don't have them like you, you just buy some new shoes now. But, you know, they used to take it to the shoe repair guy. But the point is, invest in your marriage. You know, it can be what you want it to be, what you dreamed that it would be. It can be better. But you got to make the investment. You got to let somebody help you to see what you may not be able to see. Yeah, it's interesting how when we go into marriage relationship, we think it's just supposed to be automatic. For some reason, you're supposed to know what I want. You're supposed to deliver it how I want. You supposed like you're supposed to know all of these things, and then we get upset when it's not known yet we haven't said, or we get upset when it's not understood yet we haven't shared. And so I think understanding that investment, it comes in so many different forms. It's not just in the form of going to a conference or going, it's everyday investments of your time, everyday investments of your energy, everyday investments of your attention that make a difference and create that intimacy with the two of you. And it's hard when you just want it your way. And we all just want it our way. And once we begin to take that growth journey of realizing it's not about me, you know, one of the things I love to say, um, not to preach with you, but one of the things I love <laughs> to say okay. is that when you look at the Bible and what it has to say about love, it is the most sacrificial thing that has ever been received express love has nothing to do with you it has everything to do about getting through you and you being able to serve and to give but we go into it thinking that love means what can you do for me love mm -hmm. is about what can you do for them um in the most sacrificial way and i love that uh you guys stuck with that journey even when it got hard right even when it got hard and 
I know for myself, turning off the exit sign was huge because for me, it was always something come up. I could do A, I could do B, I could do C, or I could get a divorce. D was always get a divorce. (laughs) And so turning off the exit sign and removing D made A, B, or C more feasible to try, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you leave it on the table, where someday you're going to grab that, you're going to grab it, right? Because it's going to seem like the right thing to do. And so I think that is an excellent strategy as well. Thank you so, so much for your nuggets. Um, I know that the testimony you have shared and, and people being able to see you in such a friendly, friendly light is going to be impactful. I don't think there's any questions in the Q&A channel, so I'm just going to close out with my standard life, love, and pursuit of happiness question. So around here, I believe wisdom is the principal thing, and I think we can learn a lot when we look back reflectively. So I always close out tapping into your wisdom around life, your wisdom around love, and your wisdom around happiness. So Dr. Burns, if you could, what would you tell your younger self about life? What is your life wisdom? I I often reflect on my spiritual journey. You know, I, I wish that I could have got saved at an earlier age, you know, and I don't mean, you know, going to Sunday school, getting saved and get baptized and then living your life only to come back around and realize you didn't really know what that was. You, you, you need something bigger than yourself, you know? And for me, I would tell my earlier self to connect with God, seriously connect with God, not go to church, you know, as far as go through the, you know, the the formats or whatever the word would be, but to seriously um, open my heart, give my life to Christ, surrender to God, and he'll he'll, he'll treat you real good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. Lady B, what about you? What is your life wisdom? What would you tell your younger self about life if you could? Interestingly, the same thing. Um, I said that I would tell my younger self to get connected to that God that you learned about at an early age, the one that your mother sent you to church to learn about, even though family wasn't going, you were sent to church to learn about God and how you knew of God and knew about God growing up in life and knowing that he was with you during your dumb days, your younger years and all that, get connected to that God. And then as life goes on, because you're going to have the trials and the tribulations and the setups and setbacks, you'll be well experienced enough to know that God is with you And he's going to help you get through the things that you go through. So get connected to God. That's what I would tell my younger self. That's so awesome. I love that. So let's let's jump into love wisdom. Lady B, what would you tell your younger self about love if you could? Um, I would first tell my younger self to love yourself no matter what. Because I um, think about how I was what I experienced and how I was treated as as a child. And there were moments, not necessarily by family, but by friends, so-called friends and and others that didn't show love. And and I had the bullying going forth. And and so I didn't appreciate and I didn't love myself because people would talk about the the complexion, the darkness of my skin or or my my frame being too skinny or having big eyes, big lips. I had all of that going on. And I I um, took all that stuff in and I didn't love me. And I got to the place where it was like, okay, I don't want to take pictures. I don't want to look at myself in the mirror, da, da, da. And I had issues with that for a long time. And and it really didn't um, break until actually I um, got married because my husband, he he showed me love. I wish you could see how he looking at you. You had to watch (laughs) this back because I mean, he is just looking at you like he going to sop you up with a biscuit when this is all said and done. I mean, it has been continual the whole time. So when you watch this, look it back because if don't nobody else love your girl, he loving on you with them looks tonight. Okay. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. So love yourself no matter what. (laughs) He turned red. 
Oh, how, how, how black man gonna turn red? You are red. <laughs> Let me take a picture of. Oh my goodness. Black man don't turn. All red. right, I'm sorry that I jumped in, but he was <laughs> he was gazing at you, so you had to watch it back. He it's a couple times I noticed it, but he, he like she said he was. <laughs> He he love you, girl. He loves you a whole whole lot. All right. All right. Finally, what's your happiness wisdom? What would you tell your younger self about happiness if you could? Dr. Burns. Happiness. Happiness wisdom. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think happiness is kind of overrated. If you ask somebody, uh, they say, I want to be happy. What does that look like? You know, is you know what was the what does that look like? Happiness wisdom. I would say it would it would go back to believing in yourself. And I don't know who said it, but somebody said you either they said you you will miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to be happy, air quotes. You, you have to have faith to believe in yourself and go for whatever it is that you that you feel you need to go for. Failure is just a step ladder to your success, you know? And so, you know, one of the things I used to share with my son about basketball was when you look at pro players, they're able, you know, like you take Michael Jordan or Kobe or one of them guys, LeBron, they can take 100 shots and miss 75 of them and then afterwards, they ready, they ready to go get something to eat. Whereas somebody else could take 100 shots and miss 75. They'll beat themselves up for the rest of their life, and they won't be no good no more. And so we can't protect ourselves from failure. And failure is really not a bad thing. You know, it's a, to me, it's a stepping stone to where you want to go. So the happiness wisdom is really have faith in yourself, believe in yourself. And, and go for it. Like you said in, in your new book, you said embrace and go. Embrace your it? power and go. Yeah, you know, and so um, the go part, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, you embrace your power, but you got to do the go part, mm -hmm. you know, and go for it. Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Enjoy, enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Ups, down, ins, out, good, bad, and ugly. You know, that's one thing I can say. I remember as a little boy, my mother didn't have a lot of money. She was a single mom. And she wasn't buying a lot of that stuff, you know, that I wanted. And so I would go out and get um, carts from the store and take the wheels off of it and make me a go-kart. And, you know, I would take the rim off of a, bi a, bas uh, off a bicycle, take the spokes out and nail it up on the pole and have my basketball hoop. So a lot of the things that I enjoy came from my imagination and my willingness to, you know, just make it happen. Now, the wheel might fall off a couple of times, but you know, I enjoyed my life, you know, so did I answer it? Did he answer it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, she did, sir. All right. Lady B, your happiness wisdom. What would you tell your younger self about happiness if you could? Um, in short, I would say choose it because ha ha being happy, um, it's a choice thing. And when you think about the emotional well-being of, of oneself, you, you have a choice. You can choose to be happy or you can choose not to be happy. And so I would I would say choose it and not be necessarily held hostage by the the ups and downs, the try the circumstances, the situations and conditions of life. Don't don't let those things get you down or get to you to the place where, you know, you don't want to live anymore or you don't you want to do away with whatever. Choose to be happy. Things are going to come. But know that there is there is still some good on the other side. And so choosing to be happy, um, I would say do that. Awesome. Well, you know what? I want to congratulate you, Dr. Burns. I know you're celebrating your 28th pastoral Ooh. anniversary. So congratulations to you. Is there anything that you guys want to share about the ministry, about anything you're doing, any products, books, anything like that? Well, you know, the, the ministry is, is going good. We're in a season of pivoting. You know, COVID changed the landscape for a lot of us. It, it may have caught us off guard, but I don't believe it caught God off guard. And so, but the ministry is, is going good. We're discovering some things that we needed to deal with uh, 
before, but now we're forced to deal with them and we're de dealing with them with a good attitude. And so I'm excited about where we are and where we're going. And so when it comes to ministry wise, um, products, we are working on a new book called uh, Turn, it Off, Turn Off the Exit Light. Mm -hmm. uh, the workbook will be uh, done by the end of this month. They'll be uh, debuting it, is that the word, mm -hmm. at a couple's ball. Jericho's mm -hmm. going to have a couple's ball. Nice. And um, as soon as Lady Burns and I get our wording to match up, the, the role flow right in, in the book, the book will be following that. Mm -hmm. uh, what else we got? That's books. Mm -hmm. you know. our, our other book with this ring, we don't have, we're working on a website platform. Mm -hmm. We just got a new website. And hopefully within the next month or so, uh, some of the products will be there. So, you know, I don't know how to tell them to get it, but, <laughs> but that's, 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 all that's, good. Uh, that's, that's all that's good. Much. Well, you got some appreciation. Um, definitely someone said they needed to hear some of the things that you guys shared. Um, must trust God more, especially in the uncomfortable and uncertain times. Um, the other one that I just want to close out with is someone is echoing my congratulations to you on your anniversary. And so I just want to close out by saying to you guys, thank you for all that you've done to support and invest in me, my family. Um, and I just want to tell you success looks so good on you. All right. Yeah, all right. All right. We appreciate that. We received that. Amen. All right. Thank Amen. you so much and have a good evening. Thank all you. All right. You too. See Bye -bye. you all later. Bye-bye. Well, that's it, beautiful. Thank you for tuning in. Don't ever forget that you are truly blessed with life, love, and all the happiness your heart can hold. Be relentless in building a life you love without apology. I'm Denise Taylor, and you can always find me in our free Facebook community. It's Embrace Your Power, easy to find. Now be sure to rate and review this podcast and share it with a friend and make sure you subscribe so that we can stay connected each week. And remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He gave us power. So be sure to always embrace your power and go.